pulls up a map of the whole country and you can see where something um, is native. Uh, in Michigan, we have the University of Michigan Herbarium's Michigan Flora Online. So if you've ever used the Voss volumes, this is the online version of that um, to help you know is something native or not to the state. And then if you're working out of state, um, there's a universal, that last link is the universal uh, floristic quality assessment, and that basically is a um, warehouse of all the different state floras. So you could pull up, um, if you're helping somebody design a native planting out of state, you could use that. Next slide. So um, I want to share you know, why it is so important to be using native plants in our intentional landscapes and conserving the native plants that we already have um, in, in our landscape ecosystems. There are many, many benefits to native plants. They do not require fertilizers and um, often need many fewer pesticides to grow well. Um, they require less water than lawns and ornamental garden plants. They help uh, reduce air pollution, um, both in you know, not having to mow as much area as often and uh, by naturally removing carbon from the atmosphere. So this is something positive that we can do in our own landscapes to help address climate change. That really intense root system that these native plants have, very dense, very deep, um, and if they're growing well, that above ground biomass really takes in a lot of carbon. Um, and they provide wildlife habitat, both in the form of um, food and providing shelter. They help promote uh, biodiversity, and that um, lends itself to help preserving our natural heritage. And I don't know if that's a term you've ever heard before, but I always like to bring it up. Um, basically, that's, you know, are where we live, that sense of place and the species that make it up is very characteristic. And you wouldn't expect um, the plants in the Midland area to be exactly the same as, say, down in Florida or something like that. And so we want to um, conserve and celebrate our natural heritage um, in the place where you're living. And uh, using natives also helps you save money um, in reduced maintenance costs, especially in the long run. And they help improve water quality and soil health. So those very deep, dense uh, root systems help increase water infiltration um, during storm events and, and reduction of storm water uh, runoff and help rebuild um, soil structure with mycorrhizal activity as well, the low ground. So basically, I see lawn as sort of this default that we use in the landscape when we don't want to design or plan for something else um, in, our, in our built landscape. And, and honestly, lawn doesn't make a whole lot of economic sense. You're always mowing it, you're always watering it, fertilizing, those sorts of things. Um, and so uh, if you haven't read Anything by Dr. Doug Talmy, I highly recommend it. He wrote, he wrote the book, uh, Bringing Nature Home, um, how you can sustain wildlife with native plants, um, and Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. And he very eloquently explains you know, why native plants um, are so key, why we should care and, and have them in the landscape. And in this book, he made a very good point about um, how our landscapes really uh, should move and they should change with time, they should be teeming with life um, and not be these still stagnant collections of statuesque plant specimens. So they should have sound and movement and, and really be lively. Um, and we really need to do a better job uh, with our landscapes, making them so. So I'm going to encourage all of you tonight to take a fresh look at your landscapes and think about where native plants could be used to benefit you, our local wildlife, and um, our community's larger ecosystem functions. Next. So let's start thinking about um, using natives, and that starts with site selection. So what are those important site factors that you need to consider?
Um, one is light availability, so not that different from standard gardening practices. Is it sunny? Is it shady? Um, what's your soil like? Is it well drained or is it pretty wet? Are you dealing with an extreme pH? Um, what's the existing vegetation? Are there things you want to keep and work around? Are there invasive species that you better have under control before you spend money trying to get native plants to establish? Um, and then, you know, where are the existing structures? It's always good to know where you, your utilities are, both above and below ground. You don't want to plant woody plants um, on top of or within those rights of way uh, most often. And, you know, other things like sidewalks, you know, where are your um, transportation paths and things like that. Uh, and you really want to think critically about your area's intended use. Is it a high traffic area? Um, are you going to be practicing you know, sports? Uh, are you trying to get a really neat wildlife viewing area established? Outdoor dining? Uh, is it a, you know, a trail system through your property? That sort of thing. Next. So other design considerations, uh, do you want it to look formal or would you rather it be informal? Um, do you want it to be attractive to wildlife? You know, if so, what are your desired species that you want to attract? For butterflies and moths as an example, you want to make sure you have their, their nectar species for the adults, but you don't want to forget the larval host plants. Um, most often those are woody species. You know, do you have deer? Uh, maybe you need an ex a fence. Do you have an existing fence you could take advantage of? Or maybe you need to install an exclusion fence uh, for what you want to do. Also think about the extent. How much room do you have to work with? That's usually directly related to how much diversity um, you can support. As a general rule, you want to plant enough of a species to be able to draw in pollinators and birds, so, you know, I say roughly three foot area um, of a given plant, and honestly our native plants look a lot better in most cases when plant, planted en masse. So um, think about the room you have to work with, um, the more diverse your planting is, the more wildlife you can support, um, and the less likely, like a single pest, um, disease, bad weather event is to completely wipe out your planting. So diversity lends itself to resilience. And um, it's also good to think about the mature height and size of what you're planting so you give it enough room to grow. Uh, what's the texture and what will that look like in your space? Uh, trying to plan for seasonal visual interest but also seasonal support of wildlife. So again, for pollinators, as an example, you want to have things blooming as early in the spring into as late in the fall as you possibly can um, to help support those species. And for birds and mammals, um, it's good to plant things with uh, persistent uh, fruit in the winter um, and things that provide fuel for key migratory periods um, and when they're raising their offspring. So it's really important that you carefully prepare your site um, to, and help protect your investment in those native plant materials. So a lot of people kind of skip or skimp on this step and then regret it later. So that's why I, I hi highlight it strongly. Um, you want to make sure the soils are prepared um, and that's one of the handouts that I'll provide in the, if you let me send you an email, um, there's a great uh, 10 steps to a successful wildflower planting that Michigan Wildflower Farm, um, one of the biggest uh, native seed producers in the state, she outlines it very nicely, um, how to do site preparation. But the, the goal is to remove existing vegetation if you're not going to keep it. Um, so you can do things like redding a uh, sod cutter, you can use low toxicity, <coughs> non-persistent herbicides like glyphosate. Um, you just always want to follow the manufacturer's directions. Make sure you're following that label and applying it carefully. 
Um, there are also organic options like solarization, smother cropping, repeated cultivation or tilling. Um, and you want to remove excessive thatch. So if there's lots of vegetation or dead vegetation, um, you can mow, you can rake, um, you may need to loosen the soil if it's a really developed, compacted site. You might want to do that um, first. Next. I'm just going to talk very briefly about soil testing. It's not something um, that I recommend um, often, but it is important to understand kind of what you're planting in, what's underneath that zone, um, and then there are a few times when I would recommend um, doing more thorough soil testing. And those would be if you know you've had a high level of previous site disturbance. Um, if there's an obvious lack of topsoil, you're worried about low organic matter content, you might want to get that tested. Um, if you've had significant trouble growing vegetation in the past, that might tip you off. But something's going on and you need to get to the bottom of that before you plant natives. Um, or if you want to grow native species with a very specific pH preference. So a lot of things in the um, Ericaceae family, the um, like blueberries and cranberries and things like that need very acidic soil. So you'd want to know if you had a very basic soil, that's probably not the best plant for your site. Um, next. And so here's some information about doing that soil testing here in Michigan. It's through um, MSU Extension. Um, and I'm also providing the link if you've never really thought about well, what is my soil texture, because that's helpful for picking out um, plants that are adapted to ecosystems with a certain soil type. Um, I recommend this uh, YouTube link. And it's, uh, you know, does it hold together in a ball? Can it form a ribbon? How long is that ribbon? We'll give you that spectrum of sand all the way to clay and sort of where your particular site um, falls within that. And then I, I'm also providing um, a couple handouts about that. So next slide. So the next decision you have to make is, are you going to use potted plant material? Are you going to try to native seeds or some combination of both. They have um, pros and cons. Uh, plants are often sold as plugs or in small pots to quart size material, especially when we're talking about native species. They come kind of in that smaller um, form. They are already um, starting to establish though, so you do get a more instant impact. They will flower sooner. Um, and they're best if you want a more structured or formal look to your planting, right? You're putting them where you want them, and that's where they're gonna start to establish. Um, downside is that that's a more expensive approach, um, buying the, the plant material already uh, potted. On the other hand, you could try using um, native seeds, you can hand broadcast, you could um, use a native seed drill, um, but it does take time to mature. I like to tell people it's gonna take three to five years to really look like something. Um, and it's going to be a more natural look, less formal. You're at the mercy of mother nature and where the different species find their little microsite and decide to germinate. Um, so it will be less, less organized, uh, but it is less, less expensive. Um, what I, I like about planting is that you can, especially if you're just starting out, you can stick a tag in the ground so you know where to look for the plant the next year, you know, barring your cocker spaniels or your squirrels or whatever, pulling the tags out. Um, and uh, I think with native seedings, it's a little trickier. There's this learning curve to get over. Um, you have to identify, you know, what are the weeds I don't want and need to manage versus what are the little native plant seedlings coming up. So. Um, some, some things to keep in mind on that front. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. And I also wanted to share some basic landscape design principles because um, with na native plantains, we really want to help those native gardens look intentional and look cared for so that they are more readily accepted by our, our neighbors um, and the general public. 
And so one trick with that is to do a neat frame, have a border, you know, something that is a cue to care, that this is on purpose, that it has a set edge. Um, you can use art, you can use habitat structures, like um, bee or butterfly houses, something like that to help with um, that, you know, having those intentional cues. Uh, you can do educational signage as well as plant markers. Um, but one basic concept to keep in mind is unity, and that's achieved through repetition and consistency. So you can repeat alike plants or objects through your um, landscape design. You can have consistency in the character of the plants, so like all the same height. Um, or general size, go for a certain texture, um, a certain flower color, or some other thing, and then use some variety or contrast to keep it from being too monotonous. Um, there's also the concept of simplicity, so maybe pick two or three colors and repeat them throughout your planting, um, or maybe just use one type of hardscape material to help tie everything together and not make it too too complicated. You can always, you know, start simple and increase your plant diversity uh, over time. And then balance, so a sense of equality in the planting that can be symmetrical, having, you know, equally spaced um, matching elements, or it can be more asymmetrical, so more um, unbalanced, but still create that unity through the repetition of some of the elements. Next slide. So uh, in designing your native garden, I'm gonna run you through an example that I did at the front of my store. Um, so you need to select your location and the, the, the figure out the size that you're going for and the overall shape. So I wanted to do a more formal planting at the front of my store. Um, I chose to make a 10 foot radius circle around, I had a riprap covered um, drain, area drain in the front, uh, so I ended up having about a 314 square foot circle that I wanted to convert into a planting bed. Um, I knew I couldn't have things too tall because it is located very near um, a public sidewalk there on the bottom of the, the aerial, um, and I wanted it to be organized, but I wanted it to be diverse and demonstrate how native plantings can be beautiful and support pollinators spring through the fall. Um, and provide year-round visual interest. And my site is hot, it is dry, and I have sandy soils. So, tough, tough site. Um, so, uh, next step is to think about, okay, given, given the area that I'm trying to plant, um, how many plants do I need? And so one of the handouts I can provide um, shows you how to calculate based on, on center spacing. Uh, how many plants do you do you need? So just as an example, if I said I'm going to put plants in there 18 inches on center, uh, my multiplication factor is 0.444 times 314 square feet. I need 140 plants to fill that that space. Um, if I decrease it to 12 inches on center, um, your multiplication factor goes up to one, and I need 314 plants. So um, it's good to plan, know how many things you need to buy to be able to um, fill a space. Uh, next slide, please. So um, given my sunny, um, very hot and dry uh, area, I, I picked drought tolerant, full sun species, um, you know, given my tough site conditions. I designed it so that the tallest plants were in the middle, um, about four feet was sort of the max um, that I chose. Um, and then like the prairie dock, the seed heads, the leaves are pretty low, but the seed heads get pretty tall. Um, and then um, picked out sh the shortest species for along the edges. I have symmetry in the layout um, and in the repetition of species locations. And I have consistency both in color. I chose a lot of um, yellows and purples um, in my species and flower shape. So I have a lot of um, things in the Asteraceae family, those daisy shaped 
um, flowers, and I used grasses and forbs to provide contrast and foliage texture. So um, sort of my finer species, I have June grass in there, little blue stem, um, lead plant, prairie phlox, and those contrast nicely with the big, large, like elephant ear looking uh, prairie dock basil leaves. Uh, and you can see, what else, spider wart. So in the middle I have spider wart alternating with um, little blue stem, and that's because I know once it flowers, spider wart likes to flop, so I just sort of push it in towards the middle, and by then the little blue stem's doing its thing and sort of takes over that um, focal point. And then here's the outer ring uh, to my planting. And I really was trying to have spring blooms for my pollinators. So I included wild strawberry, brown leaf ragwort, and prairie phlox. Um, early summer blooms I get from the sand coreopsis, the wild petunia, the foxglove beard tongue, and the spiderwort. And then later in the summer into the fall, um, I have purple coneflower, woodland and western sunflower, northern blazing star prairie dock, and prairie heartleaf faster. So in this little 10 foot radius circle, I have at least 16 species. And I kind of think I may have snuck a few others that I don't have on the slide. So um, it is a diverse planting, but hopefully it won't be too overwhelming because of the repetition in flower color and shape and things like that. Uh, next slide. So here's what it looked like when I uh, first started in June of 2020 uh, for my site prep. I was basically tired of paying someone to mow the lawn, which was really a bunch of weeds. And um, so for my site prep, I used glyphosate, a brand name would be Roundup, um, to kill the existing vegetation. It took uh, two rounds, uh, several weeks apart. And I was really trying, in my case, to do minimal soil disturbance because I knew if I tilled, I'd just be bringing up more weed seed. So um, I did minimal soil disturbance and used a chemical application to, to do my site preparation. Next slide. And then this is what it looked like planted in mid-June of uh, 2020. I started with uh, plugs, the little two-inch uh, pots that I carry at my plant sales, and a few quarts. Next slide. Um, and here's what it looked like in uh, June of last year, mid-June of last year. So I really felt like, okay, it's starting to look like something. Uh, by the end of the summer, I had bees, I had butterflies, little goldfinches jumping around my um, sunflower species so um, it's we're making progress out there next slide can I ask yeah um, so when these get established they'll need less water right. but how much did you have to water it using plugs I I watered I mean we had a crazy spring this past year got really warm and very dry and so I just washed my plants and when they started wilting I'd water. So it was multiple times a week for several weeks. We had a crazy June, like May, June. Um, so it is, uh, and that's kind of like the point of this slide, native plantings are low maintenance but not no maintenance and if anybody tells you they're no maintenance don't believe them. Um, but it is important to yeah watch those things and as they're getting their root systems established, you might need a supplemental water. Um, I think mulching is really important, uh, especially in that more organized kind of um, formal type of plantings. And it's a great way, one, to hold moisture um, in your new planting and then to help reduce uh, weed establishment. So I use it for those things and then I purposely plant low growing plants that spread out and ground covers that will eventually take over that function of water retention and taking up space to prevent weed establishment and I don't I don't keep remulching every year. Um, we don't need plants kind of separated by a bunch of mulch. I let everything grow together. Um, 
You'll also have to think about doing weeding and invasive species removal. If you had a tough site, there's a good chance you might have to keep an eye out for those invasive species that might try to reestablish or what often happens is you get rid of one invasive species and then another wave of something <laughs> comes and takes its place. So you want to you know, keep an eye on what's actually growing out there, um, replant, um, replace plants, replant. Um, you might lose some, maybe even though you, know, you were following the guidelines for what something likes, it's just not working well with your site, you might need to pick a different species. Um, and then sometimes if mulch is your cue to care, your, your border on your planting, maybe you would re-mulch there um, or make sure you know, all those edges stay um, neat and tidy. And you can also use mowing um, and burning to help. Mowing is great. Um, one of fire isn't an option. A uh, great way to manage annual weed species, especially if you're doing a seeding. Um, mowing the first, a couple of times even, the first year or two um, to keep weeds down, to keep them from reseeding themselves, that can be helpful. Um, and especially in, in prairie plantings, um, burning is a great way to help um, reduce thatch and kind of reinvigorate a lot of those native plants. They're adapted to fire. Um, you just want to make sure you're, you're using a professional who knows how to use prescribed fire as a, as a management tool. Another question, do you do any uh, seed collection to try to keep your, keep it looking the way you originally planted or are you going to just let it interseed all over the place so it just becomes one big? I think it depends on your aesthetic goals. Me at home, I like the, I'm, I'm very much on the landscape ecologist end of what a landscape architect is and so when things move I'm like, ah! I got it right, they're happy, you know, they're reseeding themselves. If you're going for that very formal look, uh, maybe you do need to pull seedlings or cut off seed heads. You just lose the, um, the food value of those seeds and things like that. So I guess wherever feasible, I'd say leave them if you can. Um, if you have a particular plant that just keeps moving on you, then yeah, maybe cutting off uh, the wilting flowers before they go to seed is a, a good management technique for you in that particular case. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted next slide. Uh, wanted to provide some resources to help you, you know, learn about these native plants and their characteristics. Uh, I rely heavily on native plant producers like nursery catalogs. They have a lot of good um, horticultural information in them. Um, natural history, you know, reference uh, books, like Michigan trees, Michigan shrubs, a lot of great information about our native woody plants, um, and university websites. And then for site preparation, a lot of the native um, seed and, and plant suppliers have helpful guidance on their websites. Um, there's some key ecological restoration handbooks that I always go to, to um, try to think about and plan um, my seedings um, and plantings, and then invasive species control references to, to help you um, if you're really battling um, a tough species. So in the 13 handouts I can provide, um, I provide several cultural guides and a list of um, salt tolerant natives. So if you have a tough, tough site next to a driveway or a parking lot or sidewalk, have that for reference. Um, next slide. And so this I just wanted to share this plant gallery um, to show you the, the diversity and the variety of flower shapes and colors you have to choose from and um, to show that it's really more than just wildflowers. Yes I have wildflowers up there but there are also trees like tulip tree um, shrubs like the Michigan holly, the maple leaf viburnum, um, and the common elderberry. Ferns provide really neat foliage textures. You think about using those. Um, and grasses can be really important for um, winter interest in texture and habitat. So next slide has um, some grasses. 
Uh, so Canada Wild Rye is a nice native cool season grass. It's a good one to use as your cover crop if you're doing a native seeding rather than something like um, wild oats or annual rye. Um, it's a neat alternative that you could you could do. Um, and switchgrass has these big airy sprays of seed heads. Um, it's a good species to use if you're doing stormwater management and like a bioswale or a rain garden. Next slide. I have a question about wild rye. Yeah. Um, is it an It's not an ant. Does it? Is it it's a perennial, so it's, that, and it, it's cool season, so it grows. So if you're using it as a cover crop in your vegetable garden, how does that work? It would just keep growing. It would keep, it would keep growing, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't be able to plant your vegetables you, like I You could, um, some people use cover crops and then kill them. Um, so to stabilize the soil and then do your seeding, your planting, so say their time has to elapse from when you um, bear the soil to when you're ready to plant, you might use it in that instance, but no, it's prepped for a vegetable garden. It doesn't make sense. No. Yep. Um, and then like big blue stem is one of our four tall grass prairie dominant species. Great way to add height and really deep root systems. Um, to your planting and little blue stem is a fun one um, you know gets maybe hip high at the tallest really pretty fall color and all sorts of white fuzzy seed heads so a lot of interesting um, fall texture and color next slide um, so I get a lot of questions about deer resistant plants so I, I provided a resource I think that one's from MSU extension um, but I always put the caveat on the deer will eat, in my experience, anything if they're hungry enough. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So um, basically, we have increasing deer populations because we have fewer predators. Um, our human populations are shifting into their habitats. We have hunting restrictions in suburban and urban areas. Um, and deer are creatures of habit. So they'll return to familiar locations. So if you're trying to put your planting where you've already had deer browse in the past, you can guarantee that you will have deer browsing um, issues with your, your new plantings. Um, and as far as palatability goes, you know, ornamentals are often fertilized and irrigated, so tastier. Um, but, uh, you know, native plants can be less palatable, the deer will still eat them. So part of me says, okay, part of my philosophy is, well, I'm planting native plants to eat it, be eaten by native wildlife. So, you know, some of that <clears throat> just happens. Um, I do suggest checking your new plantings frequently the first few weeks because deer, when they're browsing, they tend to bite and tug and they'll just pop those little plugs right out. And so, you get to them fast enough, you can tuck them back in and water them, and they'll be okay. Um, I really do recommend fencing off um, trees and shrubs for at least the first growing season or two until you kind of see how much interest the deer show and to give them time to really get their root systems established and be able to um, recover from, from some browsing. Next slide. So in that handout I'm providing, here's some of the native um, species that they mention. Uh, fuzzy, um, weird scented things like yarrow, the, the foliage has a distinctive odor. Um, they mention wild columbine, purple coneflower, black-eyed Susans are very hairy. Um, things like the Canada wild rye and our other native grasses. Um, for some reason, they have flowering dogwood, red, red osier dogwood, spice bush, and paper birch on there, and I've seen all of those just decimated by deer. So take that one with a grain of salt, um, and be careful on that one. Not all the species listed are native, um, but it should give you some guidance of what um, they may you know, save for eating last um, in, in a landscape. Next slide. Um, so I wanted to share how do you select species for pollinators. Um, get lots of questions about that. 
First, you have to know who your pollinators are. So when I use that term, I'm talking about um, bees and butterflies, but also we have lots of native moth species, flies, beetles, um, birds, wasps, and mammals. And those pollinators need some basic things. They need food, uh, nectar, pollen, fruit. Um, their larvae need the leaves, the vegetation of our native plants. They need shelter. So that can come in like multiple canopy layers of vegetation. Sometimes it's bare ground. A lot of our native bees um, are ground nesting. A lot of our bumblebees in particular. So um, having a place where they can access uh, the ground is important. You can't do that if you have eight inches of mulch everywhere. Um, and uh, water. So whether it's naturally occurring or you, you know, human provided water in the landscape, that, that can help them out too. So um, the, the nectars and the flower, the nectar and the flowers that we provide is high in sugar and um, necessary amino acids. Pollen is very high in protein, um, and the leaves. Uh, are often, um, you, you want the host plants for the, the larvae, so the caterpillars of our butterflies and moths, and often those are woody species. So I have a whole set of, you know, subset of handouts that are focused on um, that, those larval host plants. And um, woody plants tend to flower earlier, often, um, in the season, and they can provide very significant quantities of nectar and pollen. Uh, right up front um, during the active season. So think about species like elms, alder, willow, red maple, you know, things that are wind pollinated and really important food source or early in the season for pollinators. Red bud, cherries, um, later in the season, tulip tree and basswood are examples. Next slide. So this is a figure um, based on research, again, from um, Dr. Doug Tallamy, the author that I had mentioned before. And, and the point is to show you that uh, our woody species support nearly five times as many Lepidopteran species, so our, our butterflies and moths, um, as forbs do. So um, you can see here that uh, you know, oak su supports over 550 different species. The others are in like the 400s, 300, mid to upper 200s. And on the right, the, under the perennials, you know, goldenrod comes in at 104, um, and all the others are are well below um, 100 species supported. So, um, and our butterflies and our moth caterpillars, they are the base of the food chains and they are a very important source of protein for our nesting birds so Dr. Tallamy always says you know if you want to have your lovely songbirds you need to have lots of caterpillars to feed um, feed their nestlings and um, this table also kind of helps prioritize which species to plant if you have limited space and you do want to support pollinators um, uh, those key species can create foraging hubs and um, where about 75% of the food for your lepidopter and um, species reside. So if you don't have a lot of room, plant a oak, plant a cherry, or plant a willow, um, and provide a lot of uh, food that way. Next slide. This is a fun tool. I don't know if anybody's ever used it, uh, but Dr. Tallamy um, worked with the U.S. Forest Service and the National Wildlife Federation to um, create this native plant finder and it helps you search for um, flowers and grasses and trees and shrubs by zip code um, to help you prioritize what species um, provide food for the most uh, lepidopteran species known from your area. So it's always changing, it's under development as new studies happen, new things are discovered. Um, it, this is an example I typed in my zip code for Midland. Um, the top eight grasses and forbs, uh, goldenrod came out on top, supporting 71 different butterfly and moth species. Wild strawberry, sunflower, Joe pieweed, and bonesa, violet, willow herb, and flax. And for the top eight uh, trees and shrubs, um, oak, 
supporting over 450 species, uh, willow, cherries and plums, birch, aspen, cottonwood, um, cranberry and blueberries, uh, crab apple and uh, maples and box elders were in the, the, the top tier of um, supporting species. Next. So yeah, there are the um, trees and shrubs. They don't have a lot of photos in there, but so those are the ones I mentioned. Next slide. Um, you can also drill down and take each plant species, or at least the genus, and see who you might be supporting. So um, in this example, I clicked on Viola. We have, I think, nine different species native in the Midland area. And it lists out um, the different butterfly and moth species that you could be supporting that would lay their eggs and their larvae would eat. Um, violets. So then, next slide. There's an example, the great spangled fritillary, beautiful butterflies only lay their eggs and their caterpillars only eat um, violets. So, uh, and in our area, I think violets supported something like 31 species of butterflies and moths, the fritillary being, being one of them. So um, if you're you know, trying to get a certain kind of butterfly in your garden, think about what, what's the host plant that that particular species needs. Um, and then next slide, we have one more. Oh, yeah, here's another example of something that um, eats violets. It, it's also, you can Google a species in, or, or search for the species in this um, tool and it'll tell you, okay, what does it eat in your area? So this is an example of giant leopard moth and if you were in my store anytime last Last summer I had like 80 to 90 of these little guys go into town eating um, oak and uh, cherry and the violets got inhaled like in a day. They, they were very much about the violets. So uh, there they are in the lower left corner. And you have to take this tool with, with a grain of salt. Just in this example I'm showing like black locust is not native to Michigan. It's native a little further south. Um, cherry is not on here, and it's, you know, I consulted other resources to see how do I feed 80 of these caterpillars all summer, and um, cherry came up, and it was, they, they preferred violets, and then they ate the cherry, and the oak was like the last thing they wanted to eat, but the easiest thing for me to get, so. Um, we'll see what happens. They are overwintering in my garage right now, and uh, I'll probably bring them back to the store and hopefully have a uh, beautiful emerging uh, giant leopard moths sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, next slide. Other considerations um, to help support butterflies and moths in your gardens, besides the plants um, and the, the nectar for the adults, kind of their, their whole active season, um, having you know sun exposure, um, protection from wind, being pesticide free, a lot of those pesticides are um, non-selective, and so it may be killing one pest, but that it also is um, will affect our, our native species. Um, having water available and, and dissolved salts in the form of nectar and dew, tree sap, um, and puddling stations, so that can be as simple as a low, damp area covered in sand that you keep open or like gravel or sand in a dish that you keep moist that they can get the nutrients out of. Those are good things to have in your butterfly and moth gardens. Next slide, that's an American copper, uh, puddling in some damp sand. Um, and then, yeah, this is just a really quick example of um, a milk, how easy it is to do this uh, if you don't care about being super formal. Um, this was an example a friend did. I think he tilled uh, up some lawn area in the fall, uh, broadcast some common milkweed seeds, let them naturally stratify, go through freeze thaw cycles um, over the winter, and that's what it looked like the following kind of uh, late spring. And it an easy way to get some common milkweed established to help support monarchs, just as an example. They all don't have to be super formal and um, time and time intensive. 
Next slide. Um, I also get a lot of questions about bird-friendly bird plantings. What can you do to help support our native birds? Um, and our native uh, trees, shrubs, and vines certainly provide a lot of services um, for our bird species. Gives them places to perch, uh, places for them to seek shelter, and of course provides a lot of food. Um, you know, both in the, um, the vegetation, in the buds, the blossoms, the fruit they produce, and by being host plants for the different caterpillars and adult butterflies that they also eat. Um, so some examples, um, you can plant red um, and other colors of tubular flowers to help attract hummingbirds. The last handout in my collection is all about native plants that support um, our ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, species like wild columbine, butterfly weed, other milkweeds, Michigan lily, cardinal flower, great blue lobelia, bee balm, foxglove, beer tongue, um, monkey flower, jewelweed, vervain, and our native honeysuckles are all good things to consider. Um, we can provide summer fruits during the breeding season for them, things like planting service berries, our native cherries, choke cherry. Again, our native honeysuckles, um, things in the genus Rubus, so raspberries, blackberries, black raspberries, or I know my family always called them black caps, but um, having those in the landscape. Blueberries, um, our native red mulberry, spice bush, and elderberry. Um, and you could attract things like cedar wax wings, our eastern bluebirds, and our American robins by having those um, species in your landscape. Providing autumn fruits during fall migration to help supply energy and help our year-round residents kind of fatten up for the winter. Um, so things like dogwoods and mountain ash, their fruit, um, the nuts and acorns of our oaks, our hickories, buckeyes, chestnuts, walnuts, American beech, and hazelnut. And you can support our tufted titmice, our jays, turkeys, and some of our woodpeckers with those species. And Winter fruits, so things that ripen late and will persist on the persist on the plants over winter. Um, that really helps our year-round overwintering birds, um, as well as those early returning migrating species. So things like crab apples, native bittersweet, our sumacs, our viburnums, eastern wahoo, Virginia creeper, um, winterberry, or some people call that Michigan holly. Um, those are great for supporting our thrushes, our waxwings, uh, pine grosbeaks, um, and northern mockingbirds. So, um, and then, of course, our, our trees and shrubs and vines provide nesting locations and general cover. Um, species like catberry, ash, honey locust, um, spice bush, poplars, willows, maples, um, what else? Black. Walnut, um, those species can really help provide um, nice nesting locations for different bird species. Uh, and then it's also important to um, have water available for them, brush piles for cover to seek shelter for predators flying through, and then sunny and shady um, microhabitats as well. Uh, next slide. And so here's uh, another fun website or tool that you can use that is zip code based. Um, Audubon has a native plant database and you can um, type in your zip code, see a bunch of native plants for your area and then really drill down on a certain plant and see what types of birds that particular species would support. So, um, another, another helpful fun website to play around on. Um, And then um, those woody plants also provide a lot of wildlife value um, just in dead material. So having dead trees or snags, standing dead trees, um, dead limbs on an otherwise live tree, um, cavities, those, the more diverse um, your system is, the, the more uh, diverse wildlife species you're going to see than if you just had all healthy live trees going. 
Um, many birds and mammals use snags for nests, um, dead branches for perching or hunting from. Um, insects will use decaying wood as an important food source and um, you know, pollinators um, like beetle larvae and mason bees will, will use them for, for nesting. So um, having, leaving that um, dead or dying wood in the ecosystem can be really helpful. Um, and then uh, another thing to think about is how our native plants promote um, natural pest control uh, and how they support predator and parasitoid species both directly and indirectly so as an example um, our native cherries, they have extra floral nectaries that um, exude nectar that attracts ants. And then those ants uh, act as predators and help protect the tree or the shrub from other insects like tiny little um, tent caterpillars or um, spongy moth, invasive spongy moth. So those nectaries are active right after bud break attract the ants and that's when those defoliating caterpillars um, are small enough for the ants to actually prey upon them. So the, the timing and how everything is interrelated I think is really cool to, to be aware of um, and, and how our native plants help with um, natural pest control. And uh, you can also support a lot of natural um, spongy moth predators and parasitoids. They depend on those native plants. So if you have ants and wasps, stink bugs, beetles, spiders, shrews and um, mice, voles, chipmunks, squirrels, skunks, raccoons, birds, the more of those you have in the landscape, hopefully the fewer um, invasive spongy moth caterpillars you will have in your landscape. Uh, next slide. So I, I think it's really important that we redefine what the perfect garden aesthetic is. Uh, native um, garden des design, I think, really redefines what is beautiful. Uh, you don't want to clean up, necessarily. It's, it's helpful if you leave that standing dead vegetation um, over the winter. You know, don't prune or remove dead branches or trees. Of course, if it's safe to do so. If it's, if it's a hazard along the sidewalk or the tree is hanging out over your house, you know, by all means, um, take it down. But where you can leave those things in the landscape for habitat, it's great if you would do that. Um, don't use insecticides. Uh, let the plants be perfectly imperfect. Um, a lot of those insecticides are, are um, non-selective and they do kill our beneficial insects and our pollinator. Um, species along with whatever pest you're trying to control. So I'm going to steal a line from Dr. Doug Tallamy um, and it's called his his 10-step program. So if you're having trouble with pests, you know, things eating your plants, you just take 10 steps back from the wildflower or the tree and all your insect problems magically disappear. Um, and it's important to realize that you know, pollinators across the Midwest have decreased by 90% in the last 100 years. Um, and North America has lost more than one in four birds in the last 50 years. So I think we really need to raise the bar when it comes to planting our landscapes. And last slide just has my um, contact information. So if you have questions, um, you can bring plant pictures in, pieces of plants. I will try to help you identify them. And you're always welcome to drop those kinds of things off at the store. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, please um, don't hesitate Where to ask. Where is the picture located? We're on uh, Wackerly, west of Eastman. So um, just, it's where uh, like Charlene's Cuisine used to be. Down the road, if you hit the ramps to US 10, you've gone too far. We're right between Valvoline and the Sleep Bench Hotel. Between which and what? The Belleville Oil Change Place okay. and the Sleep In Hotel. Oh, you're close, you're not far off. Mm -hmm. no, not far off of not far off of Eastman. So yeah. That's what I had. Do you have any comment?
It was a wonderful presentation. First, I'll start with that. Um, when I, in the 1970s, I encountered two problems. I had been a, as a child, I had been rescued by the woods, and I learned a lot about vernal, especially uh, vernal spring flowers. And uh, what I observed in the 70s was a lot of my favorite habitats were falling prey to uh, improvements, uh, railroad grades that were being torn up, or subdivision development, or some combination of that. In some of my favorite places, I um, was I was so sad. And uh, but the other problem I encountered is in the 70s they started a family. And time, when you have a family, a young family especially, time is of the essence. Sure. As a teacher, so. Those are the two problems. And what I did is I started what I call plant rescue. Okay. I started a 50 year journey now of rescuing plants. And I would, I would go to these habitats and I would, when they were digging around in the construction site, I would rescue plants. And I was lucky enough to own a gully on the, a, a drain, we call it the gully, yep. off of the Titabawassee River. And so I had an acre and a half, and, but the gully was the prized spot. And so I would rescue them, and then I would stick them in the ground, and that solved one problem. Mm -hmm. I knew I had done my best to salvage those plants. The other problem I had was that one was the time and the kids. Uh, you, if you all know about Mother's Day in this time of the year, it's prime time. And I was teaching school, and I was raising a family, and I had to know exactly when it was. You know, this year we're probably a week to seven or eight days off the typical schedule. So I called this my wildflower sampler, my barometer. I called it my wildflower barometer. Okay. It told me what the critical moment might be to ditch everything and go to the woods <laughs> for at least an afternoon, a Sunday, or a, a whole weekend sometimes if I was lucky. And now we fast forward to the 90s. I, I've had that wonderful 20 years. But then my life was about to change and I was in, at risk of losing this wonderful acre and a half space. And I had to make some choices about keeping it or not. And this is what I observed and the reason that I still own it today, it's called Peterson Meadow is because what I observed those wildflowers to do is they actually moved in the direction of their preferred habitat. The ones that like the north face went north. The ones that like the, you know, closer to their feet, closer to the water, they went toward the water. The ones that could stand it up on the edge of the cut meadow, they went there. And it was so impressed by that, how intelligent those plants were, and how much they showed me, and I was, and now I was, I was the possession of the many generations of of uh, dog tooth of, of violets and uh, hepatica and all kinds of plants that had been rescued, may apples, whatever. And so, I just want to say, there is an adventure here. If you don't believe me, yeah. I'll tell you more of the story, but I'll let it go at that. Just to say thank you for uh, for affirming it by some of the things you were showing us tonight in an even, an even more formal way. But anyway, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You're always learning. Oh, Nothing absolutely. quite goes the way you think it will. That's why they came up with the term adaptive adaptive management. You will, you know, try something and it doesn't work. So you try something else. You plant something and it moves on you and that happens. Yep. So. I do, I tell people too that um, our native plants are smart and a lot of people are impatient this time of year and want to see things growing and they, you know, want things blooming and just say our native plants are smart. They know that it can snow in May in Michigan and so they're just not doing a whole lot yet and that's, that's how they survive. I'd like to ask a question, maybe you know that I have been observing that nursery plants, especially the ones that cry, create such variety because they're done with tissue cultures instead of 
actually being grown from seeds. Okay. They don't seem to have a lot of the characteristics of, of, of native plants in terms of hardiness or, you know, uh, just all kinds of characteristics beyond color and maybe height or, you know, uh, blooms, you know, uh, time. Is, is there actual research being done about the, the, uh, the veracity of tissue culture grown uh, plants and development versus those that come from seeds and more traditional ways of propagating and so forth? I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, I've seen studies of like um, straight up natives compared to cultivars of those native species and okay. like double flowered and in those studies I think what I've heard so far have been sort of, it's not, they're not looking at um, survivorship, they're looking at are the pollinators using them or not? Are the cultivars as useful to our native and beneficial to our pollinators as um, the straight up native species? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Bill Schneider, the owner of Wild Type Native Plant Nursery, has a really nice article under, I think, helpful hints on his website. Um, it's called Genetically Speaking. And he talks about why it's so important to him to wild collect seed and have genetic diversity and not to keep propagating off the same set of genetics over and over and over again. Um, so I definitely recommend um, reading that article. And I, I can't remember if there's scientific references in that or, or not, but certainly um, I think a lot of survivorship comes out of that, that diversity. And if, if we keep just doing cuttings or tissue cultures of the same thing, we're not preserving, preserving that. Um, I think we're, we're missing out and we're losing, losing some After you killed your grass in your, in your circle, but you did it was about, you, I didn't even have to turn grass. It was awful. Well, it looked like, it was a lot, it looked like a lawn yeah. that you killed there. Yeah. What did you do? What was the next step after that? Did you, put, did you remove that? Did you I had, so the land, the, the, nope. Nope, because I did not want to bring up more weed seeds. So um, a lot of people think that it's turf. And it's because the landscapers came through and you know mowed it this tall. I actually made them stop mowing. People probably thought, who's this crazy new you know store owner? I let everything grow up so I could see what it was and not have them mow it down every couple of weeks so I could see and then make a judgment for myself. Okay, I have all these different weed species. You know, not a lot of habitat value here. I don't even have turf grasses. I don't really have lawn. And so I had them, um, I let them mow, and then I said, stop, I'm gonna take over, and um, waited a couple of weeks, let that, uh, those weeds start growing actively again, then hit them with, um, with glyphosate, because that works best when the plants are actively growing, that helps the chemical translocate down to the root system, and that's how that herbicide works, it kill, kills it from the roots. Um, and, it's such a hot, dry site. I didn't really, there wasn't a ton of growth and I didn't have a lot of thatch. So I just, you know, dug holes in the dead weeds, basically. I didn't really have to do anything else. Okay. On a different kind of site, you might have more of thatch. You would need to mow and rake off or burn off or, you know, something something like that. But, Because um, it, look, it looked like after you plant, you put your plugs in and the plants, it looked like everything was very neat. There was, wasn't anything in between your plants or anything. No, like and I and I put a good three, four inches of mulch around everything again okay. to help with weed growth suppression and um, uh, moisture retention. I did have I never keyed it out, but I think it's one of the goose grasses or crab grass or this terrible rosette forming grass where you try to pull it and it just breaks off at the base. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I was in there with a soil knife, like cutting this stuff out. So that, that did come through the, um, the mulch layer, even after two rounds of herbicide. Um, but, you know, I did that and just sort of 
kept the mulch in place that first um, and second growing season, and now things are really starting to fill in and spread, and um, I'm okay. pretty happy. I, I couldn't tell what was on there what was the mulch. Yeah, yeah. I used the cedar mulch. What kind of mulch do you use? Cedar. Cedar? Okay. I like the smell, and it's pretty fine and easy to work with. Other types work too. Ground up leaves at home, I just use a lot of the oak leaves that fall naturally and um, use that as a layer of, of mulch in my beds. And um, yeah, that works well too. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to speak to that issue. Um, when I lived on this property for 20 some years, I maintained the meadow and it was never questioned. When I moved, when I was forced to move away, and I was no longer a resident, they began to aggressively enforce a ten-inch rule, or a, now it's an eight or six-inch rule, mm -hmm. and it had it was mandatory mowing. I became I became convinced after ten years that all the diversity in my lawn, in my meadow, was being destroyed, and only the most aggressive ugliness, the noxious weed that they were so against, had the tenacity to hold on because of the treatment. It took me five years to fight to reverse those, those ordinances mm -hmm. to allow me to experiment with restoring it as a meadow. Mm -hmm. The miracle is that in five years now, I now am beginning to see those more tender grasses, those more you know, exciting, all kinds of things are coming back. Mm -hmm. And they're actually forcing that stuff that was taking over. Mm -hmm. I have clumps of some more aggressive grasses that are native, but they're, they're, they're hemmed in mm -hmm. by things like common blue violets. Mm -hmm. you can't, can you believe that? Violets yeah. can force something much more aggressive, or seemingly aggressive, to, to keep in its place. And, and I think that so that's exciting to me. Yeah, and I think a lot of municipalities are moving in that direction, um, allowing you know the yes having the weed ordinances in place, but modifying it to recognize that our native vegetation is not a weed; it has value, and those types of gardens are important, and uh, height height is less of a of an issue. Yeah, it, it's a hard one, but a lot of Thank you.